Okay, welcome to the El Paso Taxpayer Revolt. Today it is our honor uh, to welcome our special guest, Bobby Flores, who is a candidate for El Paso County Sheriff. Thank you, Dan. The honor is mine to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Great to see you, Bobby. Can I call you Bobby? Yes, yes, please do. Please call do. me Max, please. Yes, thank you. And at the outset, let me just state that we have fully endorsed Mr. Flores. Uh, Bobby is by far, we feel, the best candidate for El Paso County Sheriff. Uh, please let the viewers know where they could uh, learn more about you and donate if they'd like. Yes, you, you can read a little bit about my biography and, and read more about my campaign at bobbyflotusforsheriff.com. And I appreciate the endorsement. That means that means a lot to me. I don't, I don't take that lightly. Thank you very much. Well, excellent. We, we analyze all the candidates, look at their platform, policy positions, uh, vet them, interview them thoroughly before we make a decision. And uh, we've only endorsed three people for the entire campaign cycle, and you're one of them. Nice, nice, thank you. So, um, I think our viewers would like to learn more about you, more than they could in a, in a standard television interview. We've got plenty of time here. Why don't we begin with uh, a little bit of your life story? How did you get into the police force? Uh, tell us about your career. Take us through your career in chronological order. Absolutely. So, my name is Robert Bobby Forbes. Uh, Bobby's been my childhood for forever. I'm born and raised here in El Paso, Texas. I graduated from Eastwood High School, Go Troop in 1989. Uh, upon graduating, uh, I wasn't good enough to play college football, so my dad told me you need to find a job. Uh, and at that time, the sheriff's office was hiring detention officers, jailers. And you only had to be 18 years old to, to apply for that position, so I, I took the test, I applied, and I passed it. And I started working in the downtown jail facility. Um, I, I graduated from high school in June. I was hired there by November 4th of the same year, of 1989. And I started working there. Most of the time, people would come into the agency. Uh, we were we were in, in dire straits during that time. We weren't the best paid agency in the world, and, and our standards definitely were not the best in the state. So we had people that came in as as, as a, a, used the agency as a stepping stone. Um, I stayed within the organization, hoping that it would get better, and it, it certainly did. Um, after a, a little bit of time in the sheriff's at, at the downtown uh, jail, uh, I tested for patrol officer, and I went to the academy. And I was only 20 years old at the time that I went to my academy, so my dad had to buy my guns. Um, I wouldn't, wasn't old enough to buy my own gun yet, and he still, he still reminds me that those guns still belong to him. Uh, and then I went out to the streets, worked patrol in the lower valley, Socorro, Montana Vista, uh, San Luisario, Fabens, Tornillo, uh, Clint, that, that area. We're responsible for the law enforcement outside the unincorporated areas of El Paso, within El Paso County. And so chronologically, when did you become a patrol officer? 1992. January, January 1992. January 92 through when? January 92, I was a patrol officer, and then in 95, I was reassigned. I was still a patrol officer, but then I was reassigned to the academy as a full-time instructor. Okay. So I was taken off the streets during that time and put in charge of training, training all of our new detention officers and our new deputies. Okay. So I stayed there through 97, and that's when I promoted to sergeant. Once I made sergeant, I was a first line supervisor. I went back out to patrol and spent another six years working the streets, the same area, still the lower valley. And, and then in 2003, I bounced over to uh, criminal investigations. And that's where I got my first taste of public corruption investigations, and, and I hold public corruption investigations near and dear to my heart because I really, really feel that uh, people who take advantage of the community taxpayer money um, need to be held accountable. So so that that's where I learned my, my public corruption. Um, that wasn't the, those weren't the only investigations we did. Uh, we also investigated crimes against property, crimes against persons, uh, murder cases as well. Um, and then uh, from there I promoted out to lieutenant went back to the academy as a, as a training director this time, and a patrol lieutenant as well. Um, and then I was assigned to the HIDA unit, which is the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Unit. It's congressionally funded, and we do, or that, that uh, section is responsible for long-term uh, sensitive narcotics cases. And they also do a lot of public corruption. And again, there's, there's my public corruption background coming up again. Uh, so I was on detached duty from my agency to the DEA, and I had 18 detectives there, and we were involved in several, several uh, very sensitive cases. Uh, I finished my school. I went to college. I was going through college throughout my years um, while working with the sheriff's office. And then in 2014, I graduated from the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia, 
and, and spent some time out there um, in, in their leadership program. How many, how many police officers from uh, the sheriff's office go to Virginia to get that kind of training? You know, it's very few. So, so as our area is, is allocated one or two slots a year, depending on the availability of the training. Um, and and um, I, was, I was fortunate. Nationally, or internationally, because this is an international program, uh, internationally, less than 1% of all law enforcement will ever be accepted and allowed to attend the FBI National Academy. But during that time, uh, from 1992, when I became a patrolman, uh, through 2012, um, I was also a member of our SWAT team. So we, we formed our SWAT team in 1983, brand new team. Sheriff Salmonio at the time decided we needed a SWAT team. And I was one of the original members. So, so we didn't have a full-time SWAT team, we were a part-time team. So it was always an ancillary duty. So you went and you did your work, and then we worked the training in, uh, you know, based on, based on availability. And um, I did that for 17 years as well. And I worked my way up from a, from a SWAT team officer all the way up to the, to the, the team commander. So let's talk about SWAT. Uh, for our viewers, what does SWAT stand for? So SWAT does, at the time, stood for Special Weapons and Tactics. I know that a lot of, a lot of organizations have gotten away from the weapons part uh, because they said it sounds a little too militaristic. Uh, I think it's called the Emergency Response Team now, but it's still the same, the, the same purpose. So. Tell us uh, what kind of things uh, the SWAT team does. Uh, that the police officers, the regular rank and file, do not do? What is special so, about SWAT? So the ideal thing with SWAT is that, number one, they're, they're specifically trained and specially trained in the use of additional weapons. We, you know, we use, utilize uh, sniper rifles, we use sub, submachine guns for, for entries, uh, chemical weapons, specialty impact munitions, um, the use of, of an armored vehicle. Um, they're usually uh, equipped with better body armor, they'll have rifle plates, um, helmets, um, you know, you're starting to see a lot more of that equipment going out to the regular patrol officer now because of the active shooter situations that are happening with, throughout the country. But back then, that, was, that gear was specifically for SWAT. And we would handle high-risk warrants, barricades, any time a, a subject barricaded, hostage situations, uh, any situation where we felt that we would put uh, a regular patrol officer, a regular detective uh, in harm's way, we would bring out the SWAT team and, and let them let them mitigate the situation rather than risk somebody else. And you guys look like soldiers, right? Full body armor, helmet, um, yes, extra yes. protection. And, and, and as cool as that is, that's no fun to train in, especially in the El Paso heat. Uh, we, you know, it didn't matter if it was 105 degrees outside. You're training with your helmet, with your vest. Right. Um, you know, it just it, you're on call 24 hours a day. So you didn't want to be that guy who who couldn't make the call out when the call outs happened because you were out, you know, having beers with your buddies or something. So there was a lot of sacrifice, not only within the organization that was required, but even in your off-duty time. So uh, let me ask you a couple questions. Um, first of all, this is very dangerous work. It, it sounds more dangerous than being a patrolman, right? I mean, SWAT is who you call when you have bank robbery, Correct. progress, active shooter. Something particularly dangerous, and there uh, you, know, you have to breach doors, yes. work, drop through skylights, and that kind of thing. Why would you volunteer for that? Well, you know, at, at the time, uh, our, our team was 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 just forming. Uh, we needed people to step up. The, the physical fitness standards back then were 45 push-ups in a minute, 45 sit-ups in a minute, seven pull-ups, and a mile and a half run under 11 minutes. There weren't a whole lot of people who were going to meet those physical standards. Fortunately, I was a young guy; I was 21 years old. Um, I could still make those standards. And, and um, I think you still can, by the way. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think, I think uh, they don't make parts for me anymore, man. Things just snap off sometimes. But, but thank you for that. Uh, we, we, we've, we've just, we just got to the point back then where it was like, hey, look, we need people to step up. Um, and, and quite frankly, it was something very new. I'd never experienced anything like that. I'd never been part of I'd never joined the military because I went into the sheriff's office right after high school. So I didn't have any, any structured military-type training. And that was quite an eye-opener once we went into our basic schools. Huge eye-opener for me. But the reality of it was that it was, it was one of those things that it just had a, that, that, that appeal to me that said, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's take this a step further and, and, and see how we can make this work. Tell us uh, about an experience that you remember from SWAT, maybe a particularly dangerous moment or something that you're always going to remember. Well, you know, in, 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 I, we always you get, you get the guys together, we all start talking about it, and of course we... we 
you know, the old SWAT guys would bring up their stories. And there's always one story uh, that, that, that everyone talks about. And it was in April of 1997. We had a call out here in Socorro. And uh, we had an individual who shot his girlfriend, his girlfriend's mother. Shit, no, shot them dead? He had shot, no, no, they, they, they lived. Uh, but he blew, he blew their, one of them, their, they, she actually lost the, the use of her arm. Shot her with an SKS rifle, 7.62 by 39, a Chinese made. And then he shot his girlfriend, but they were able, they were able to save him. Um, but we still had the offense of, of criminal attempted uh, murder. So we went out there, we set up our perimeter. And uh, after about four hours of trying to negotiate, trying to communicate with this individual, uh, we made, or the, the SWAT commander at the time made the decision that we were gonna go into the house and get him. Now, keep in mind, this is the 1990s. Things were a little different back then. Um, that's not how you would handle that sort of situation in today's world. Uh, we didn't have any chemical munitions back then, so we couldn't gas them out and bring them to us. So the decision was made, let's go in. So as a breacher, I, I, I used a, a, a ram, you know, a mechanical breach. And so uh, I didn't have a long gun with me. I only had my sidearm. So I, I, I moved up. We, we were able to yank off the wrought iron, which everyone in this area has. Uh, we yanked off that wrought iron with a truck. And then I started breaching the, the, the actual uh, front door. And um, I realized that the door had given from, had already been, had already been uh, displaced from, from the door jab. But there was a couch that was pinned up against the door because this individual had already barricaded himself and, and had time to move some furniture around. So I wedged myself between the door and the couch and started pushing the door open. And, and we were successful in doing that. We were able to open the door, couch fell down, but here I am standing there in the threshold and I'm looking down the barrel of a Chinese SKS rifle. And he was about maybe 25 feet away from me. And he just opened up. He had a, a, a aftermarket de uh, detachable magazine. Was very full, rounds. Fully automatic. Not full automatic, but it might as well have been. Right. You know, he just opened up with that with that gun, and, and the rounds were whizzing by my head, by, right the wall right next to me, blowing out the glass. Um, it's definitely a humbling experience. Uh, the team was able to maneuver around me. They deployed a couple of flashbangs, and here I am with only a ram in my hand and my sidearm. So I fell in behind the team. We were able to, to work our angles around him. He had barricaded himself in the kitchen and set up additional furniture. And once he ran out of ammo, thank God he didn't hit any of our, of our members. Uh, once he ran out of ammunition, he dropped his rifle and then, and then, barricade, and then hid underneath the furniture. And we, we came around and took him into custody. We took him alive. Yes, we took him alive. That was merciful. Yes, and you know, it, 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 was, it was one of those things where, you know, emotions are running high, you know, your visibility is skewed because of the, the smoke from the, from the, uh, the flashbangs. It was, it was quite a learning experience for all of us, and, and that's when we realized, hey, you know, this isn't fun and games. This is, this is for real. There, there, there are some consequences, potential consequences right. for, for doing, doing this line of work. And yeah, you know, it, I, I learned from it, but I think, I think as a team we grew, and, and it made us better. Right. I mean, clearly, Bobby, you're not the kind of guy who served behind a desk, you were on the front lines, uh, in a patrol car, or breaching doorways with SWAT. I mean, you really have a broad uh, understanding of law enforcement, multiple perspectives here. Yes, yes, I've been, I've been very blessed in my, in my career, and that's, that's the term that I would use. I had the opportunity to work, you know, uh, patrol, investigations, training. Uh, the tactical training that I received, you know, has, has been has, you know, it's been, it's been invaluable to me. And um, just the opportunities that I've had throughout my career. And, and I've always tried to share that. I've always believed that, that knowledge that's not shared is, is ignorance on our part. You know, you try to contain that and you do no good for your organization. So I've always tried to share that. And, and to this day, I still work at El Paso Community College with their law enforcement program. And I always try to impart whatever I've learned onto them, hoping that we'll have better officers work in our community. And I think we've got some pretty good officers out there. Now, one of the things that distinguishes you from your opponents is that you also have quite a bit of administrative experience. You've managed a very large budget, well into eight figures. Take us forward in your career uh, through your administrative qualification. So, so after I graduated from the FBI National Academy, the current sheriff uh, uh, appointed me to commander. Um, when I, when I, as soon as, as soon as I arrived in Quantico, Virginia, I was reassigned from the DEA to the jail annex. Uh, the jail annex at the time was a $36 million budget, 333 officers plus civilian employees. And we can't forget how important they are. And then an additional 1200 inmates. Um, and 
the jail actually was also undergoing an expansion project, and that was up around $20 million, if, if my memory serves me correct. So there was a lot of moving parts, a lot of, a lot of things that we needed to manage. Um, so, so I did that uh, for a little over a year, and then I got moved back to the law enforcement side as a commander, and I, I did the RFP for our body cameras and our tasers and our use of force simulator. And, and this was a 30-page RFP to make sure that all of our, our I's were dotted, T's were crossed, and we wanted to make sure that we got the right equipment. I'm a big proponent of having body cameras on all of our officers, and we achieved that back then. Um, that, that, that came out. And it's not the cameras and the tasers that are, that are expensive. It's the storage of the video that's really expensive. So we were able to get a, a package deal, um, and, and, and we got that rolling. And then... After, after my time there in, in, in planning research and accreditation, uh, I jumped back over to criminal investigation. So now I oversaw the entire division, um, our, our major crimes unit, our fugitive, our fugitive unit, crimes records, evidence and forensic section, our civil section, um, and our, both narcotics, our, 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 our local narcotics and our hiding unit. So I oversaw uh, all, of those, all those sections and, and made sure that, that we did the right thing. And I'm very, very proud to say that, you know, I mean, we, you know, leadership is everything in law enforcement. And, and you know, with the right leadership, your officers do the right thing, hopefully. Um, they're always gonna make mistakes, you know, because they're people, uh, but, but we never have any wrongs committed. And there's a big difference between a mistake and a wrong. And, and I'm proud to say that, that, that my division, you know, in criminal investigations, you know, it, it, it was, it was we, we did a pretty good job. Um, we handled officer-involved shootings, murders, an officer involved killing, which I hope to God we never have to experience again. You know, overseeing those investigations is very stressful because you want to make sure that you do the right thing because the last thing you want is for that case to go to court and be pled down because of sloppy police work. Right, but you got to be precise. So we've got to make sure that we know what we're doing right. Your, your, your evidence gathering, your search warrants, everything has to be done well. So I stayed involved with my people. Now, my people did the work. I am not going to take credit for the work that my people did. But I oversaw what they were doing. I, I, I reviewed what they were doing, and I'm very proud of the men and women who who, who made that assignment for me successful. Did the DA and prosecutors appreciate your meticulousness? Yes, I, I think so. I think so. Uh, we worked very close with with the DA uh, at the time, and 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 uh, we worked very close with his with his trial chiefs, um, and of course they helped us immensely. You know, because we always made sure that that hey, this is what we're getting ready to present. If there's if there's something that's lacking here, you know, let us know. Um, one of the things that, that I made sure is that our egos were not going to be involved in this. If somebody says, hey, you guys need to go back and work on this, we're not, we're not going to sit back and say, well, you're not going to tell us what to do. You know, how dare you? We're the police, right? So we made sure that we made the corrections and we made sure that we put together the, pro the, 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 the right product collectively and collaboratively so that when they went to court, they had all that they needed to get that conviction. Did you often have to testify? I did that as a commander. Uh, my detectives did, my sergeants did, I believe my lieutenant did as well. The night that, that we had one of our officers shot and killed, 2 o'clock in the morning, I rolled out there. Um, I, I, I woke up as soon as I got the call, I, we sent our people out there, but I've always prided myself on being a boots on the ground leader. Uh, I wasn't going to be the guy that says, hey, I'll be in at 8 o'clock, 8.30, and then you brief me on what happened. I went, I went straight out there and assisted with the, with, with the search and securing the scene. Once the individuals were taken into custody, I went back to headquarters to oversee the, um, the interrogations to make sure that no rights were violated and make sure all procedures were in place because the last thing we wanted were any statements being thrown out as well. So, so I stayed involved, but since I wasn't the person who was actually doing, conducting the investigation and conducting the interrogation, I didn't have to testify, but I testified many times before in both federal court and district court. Okay. So uh, you served on a SWAT and led the SWAT team until 2010? Until 2012. Until 2012. Yes. 2012. And yes. then uh, take us forward all the way to your... So, so after, after, we, after we finished, check that. The SWAT team was done until 2010. I'm sorry. 2010. Yes, okay. 2010. You're absolutely correct. And then um, after I finished my, my time as a commander, uh, the current sheriff came and, and, and talked to me and said, Hey, look, we, we have this position of assistant chief. Sheriff Watts. Watts. Yes, Sheriff Watts. The, the current sheriff, yes. And he told me that... Uh, he could use my leadership and my experience at the annex. Again, this is the second, this would have been my second tour of duty. And uh, he says, we're, we're going back to the annex. We're now, that budget is now $42 million as opposed to 36 from the first time. 
Uh, I had less officers. Instead of 333, I only had 276. And I had more inmates. Instead of 1,200, I now had 1,800 inmates. And on top of that, I had a special needs section, and I, and I had the, 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 uh, the inmates that were suffering from mental illnesses. So that's a whole nother, whole nother uh, ball of wax that we had to deal with. How large was, it, was your budget? $42 million. $42 million. Yes, sir. And you were in charge of managing that budget? Yes. Did you stay with the budget? Absolutely. Absolutely stay with the budget. So you ran tight? Yes. You have to. You have to. I mean, you have to watch your overtime. You have to watch your spending. Um, you have to make sure that that um, you're not you're not projecting too many too many costs too far ahead, and 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 purchasing purchasing things that that, that are unnecessary. Remember, this was also during uh, we had just come off of the COVID the COVID issue, and so we always had in the back of our mind we need to prepare for the next time something like this happens. So. Not only did we just run our normal jail operation, but we also had to project in the event that there was a resurgence of COVID. And I know that there were a couple of other uh, viruses that were floating around out there and people were telling us, hey, this is the next COVID. So you not only have to run your operating budget, but you've also got to project, project for any, any particular challenges that are going to be coming in in the future. So that was also something that we had to deal with. But in 2022, um, when, when I was there as the assistant chief of the, of the jail annex, we had our best jail inspection that we've had under this current administration going back to 2009. And when the jail inspectors came out and talked to us, they said, this is, this is a tight ship. This is the way jail should be run. And I was very proud of that. I was very proud of my people who made that possible. Uh, but, you know, getting accolades from uh, a, an organization such as the Texas Commission on Jail Standards, who are very strict and rightfully so, um, it, it, it felt really, really good. And, and so I was very proud of the work that I did there. Right, and so you retired in 2023, last yeah. year. So yeah. in July, this took me all the way into July, um, and then I made the decision to retire so that I could run my campaign for sure. Um, it just seemed like I'd worked my way from detention officer to, to sergeant to lieutenant to commander to assistant chief, and, and it, just, it just made sense to me that the next step has gotta be the guy in charge, it's gotta be the sheriff. Um, I have all the qualifications, I have the experience, and I think I could, I could, I could drive this bus, you know, and I can make the, the community proud, and I can make the taxpayers proud. Make sure that that, that we run the 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 budget responsibly, fiscally fiscally responsible, um, and and also take care of our employees because your employees make up the organization. Mm -hmm. I've always gotten the sense that you're fiscally responsible. I mean, would you describe yourself as a fiscal conservative, somebody who tries to keep? The administration is small and efficient. Yes, absolutely. You want you want to make sure that uh, you treat that money like it's your money, right? You know what I mean. So 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 when, when when you get your budget, you start you start allocating what your short term needs, your long term needs are going to be, and then you start you, know, you you limit yourself. You want to make sure that that you're not you're not blowing a forty two million dollar budget, you know, within your first two months, and then and then you don't have you don't have any any money saved up in the event that there's a a, a, a pandemic or, or or you know something that comes up. Um, you know, law enforcement is constantly evolving, constantly changing. There's new challenges that we don't project. Um, but you have, to, you have to have that what if mentality all the time. So that keeps you in check and, and, and it keeps you from, from blowing your budget frivolously. And, and, you know, it's just not possible for us to be going back to commissioner's court and asking for additional money from the taxpayers here in this community and, and because we didn't properly budget for it. Right, right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, family. You've got children. I do. I have. I have a, a daughter, and uh, she's she's blessed us with uh, four granddaughters. So, uh, and we also have a grandson on the way. Um, and then my wife, uh, she has two children of her own. They're also in their thirties, mm -hmm. and we have three additional grandkids there. So we've got seven grandkids, soon to be eight, running around all you know when, when, whenever whenever we all get together. Now, there's nothing like having grandchildren to drive you as as, as a sheriff keeping us all safe. Right? Absolutely. You know, you, I'm vested in my community. Right. Um, I, want, I want my grandkids to have safe schools. I want our kids and, and everyone in the community to be able to go to the store um, and shop in safety without, without being afraid of active shooter incidents. I mean, you have to be vested in, 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 in your community. And I certainly am. Like I said, I've, I've, never, left, I've never left El Paso for, for greener pastures. Um, I love El Paso. I love our community. So I, I want to stay here and I want to make things better here. 
and I and and public safety is definitely at the top of my at the top of my list. You see um, other countries that that don't have law and order societies, and you see the problems that it causes. Haiti's going through that right now. You know, you've got you've got these gangs that are just coming up, and they're fighting the government, and you know it'll destroy a community. And we want to make sure that that never happens. Right, right. Now, um, changing subjects. El Paso Matters. Uh, one of the reporters came after you twice, not just you, but right. several of your opponents, uh, looking at your very long, long record and finding some infractions. Correct. And I want to give you the opportunity to respond to their allegations. So, you know, I mean, I appreciate what El Paso Matters is doing. I mean, you know, putting, putting facts out there and letting people know all the information about the candidates, is, it's very important. And, yes, it is, yes. And, and, and I, do, I, do, I do truly believe that that's, that's the right thing to do. I felt that the stories were a little slighted, and this is why. Uh, in law enforcement, uh, we have a progression of discipline, and your lowest level of discipline is a letter of reprimand. And that wasn't explained in the article. A letter of reprimand essentially is, is a, you know, when, when, the admin, when, when the organization looks at you and says, this is what you did, or this is what we believe you did, here's a letter of reprimand, it goes in your file, but there are no penalties assessed to it. It, it doesn't affect your, your ability to promote. It doesn't affect, you don't lose any pay. You still get your step increases. It's, it, it's merely a warning, a written warning. To keep you in line. To keep you in line and make sure that you right. don't commit the same offense again. So we're all about behavior modification by, by letting you know what's wrong and don't make the same mistake twice. Right. And, and I hold myself accountable to all my years of law enforcement. 33 years, I've got four or five letters of reprimand, you know, in, in 33 years of work. And, and that's pretty good. I've never been suspended, never been transferred, obviously never been fired, never been demoted. None of those were even on the table for me. I mean, these, I, I committed minor infractions, but that's not how the article came out. Don't most police officers commit minor infractions? They do, they do. Well, there's a saying in law enforcement, if you're out there working, you're gonna get, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get some discipline. Well, you're, you're a frontline police officer, SWAT 17 years, uh, very high stress, your life is at risk, you're raising your family at the same time. There's so much going on, and it seems like infractions are almost inevitable. You're going right. to make mistakes. You're human. Absolutely, and and mistake, and that's just it. You know, mistakes are made by people, and people work in organizations. Um, and, and and like I said, I had no problem with it. The issue with the with the article was that not only did they not explain that, but they also compared my opponent to to the, my opponent's uh, internal affairs record. Well, my opponent's never worked in an agency that's had an internal. Affairs. So, of course, he comes across as, as being flawless. Now, I don't know if You're talking about uh, Oscar Ugarte. Yes. Yes, Oscar Ugarte. So, so, and again, a nice guy. I appreciate what he's doing. I've got nothing bad to say about him on, 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 a, on a personal level. But qualifications-wise, I don't think, I don't think we're, we're on the same level. Um, he's never been in an organization that has an internal affairs investigative process. Um, and, and, you know, your internal affairs jacket is going to follow you everywhere because it's important that we don't have an officer who, who gets in trouble in one agency and then bounces to another agency and becomes what we call a gypsy cop. So, so it's, it's a very important that you have that accountability in each organization and that that follows that officer. Again, my disciplinary record, because I've worked in an agency that has accountability to, for its actions to the community, of course I have one. Um, but my opponent doesn't have them. So when they write this, this letter and they say, look at how many times this person has received this letter of reprimand, um, which by the way, again, is the lowest level of, of discipline. And then you have this individual over here who doesn't have letters of reprimand. The inference or the implication there is that, is that, is that he, he doesn't get in trouble or he's never done anything to get in trouble. But that's not, that's not entirely true. And we need to point something out here. Uh, El Paso Matters and other media outlets uh, have recently been focused on city letters of reprimand. So Cassandra Hernandez, current city yes. rep, received a letter of reprimand for stealing thousands of dollars worth of gasoline funded by taxpayers. And Claudia was at Rodriguez, same thing. And uh, a letter of reprimand from the city is a very serious thing. It's, um, it's presented by the City Ethics Commission. Very, very different from being a police officer and receiving a reprimand. And El Paso Matters, in my opinion, should have pointed that out. Yes, I, I would have. In the reader's mind, they get them confused and they right. don't understand severity. Right, right. They're not. They're not one and the same. And I could tell you that that you know, if a law enforcement officer had had done the had been in the situation with the the gas stealing issue, 
there would have been a criminal investigation and the internal investigation would have been much more severe than just a letter of reprimand because now that person has also committed a criminal act. So aside from the criminal action, that person would have probably been fired because you just committed a criminal act as a public servant, which enhances the penalty. Yeah, what would happen to one of your subordinates if he or she made up for thousands of dollars of cash? They'd be done. They wouldn't be working for us. Because you lose your credibility as a law enforcement officer after that. You can't trust them. Now, if I can't trust you with a gas card to fill up your patrol car, your assigned unit with gas without committing a criminal offense, how can we trust you with taking people's liberties? Because as a law enforcement officer, you can seize a person's freedom temporarily while you're conducting an investigative detention or when you make an arrest. So if we can't trust you with a gas card, how can we trust you with a gun where you can potentially kill somebody as well? These are all very, very real questions. And these are the questions that you ask every single time that you bring an officer's discipline record into question. Is that if they're not trustworthy with the gas card, how can we trust them with the patrol car? How can we trust them with a gun? How can we trust them with the authority to take a person's freedom if necessary? Right, exactly. So let's talk for a little bit about your opponent. You and Oscar Ugarte prevailed in the first round of the election. Now there are just two of you, you and him. And the voters are going to have to decide between two Democrats on what date? May 28th. It's coming up. Yes, it's coming up. Less than a month and a half. So Ugarte was asked by the media more than once, what is your top priority? What would be your top priority should you become sheriff? And his answer was, well, I would create a social services unit and I would send in social workers into domestic violence situations. So he's talking about, on the one hand, vastly expanding government, creating a whole new agency with staff. They have to have pensions. They have to have offices, maintenance, everything else. We're way into the millions, maybe the tens of millions of dollars just to create that. And then there's the question of, I mean, you've breached doorways in domestic violence situations. You just described one with multiple casualties. Is that where you send a social worker? You know, you have to look at the big picture there. You know, first of all, the answer is no. That's not the atmosphere or the environment that you want to send a social worker to. Or think not. You know, so, but you know, when you're going to start a social services unit within a law enforcement organization, you're going to have to fund it. Our budget, you know, upwards of $137 million is pretty well stretched already in order to provide public safety and run our jails. I don't know where you're going to find the money within our existing budget to start an entire new section dealing with social services when you've already got those services outside of law enforcement. So now you've got a strong duplication of efforts and resources there because you're going to have to pay employees. You're going to have to pay their benefits, you know, which is an additional 30% above their salary. You're going to have to give them cars, you know, because they're not going to be responding to personal vehicles. So your gas price, your gas consumption is going up. Your units are going up, number of units, car insurance. There's just so many things that you've got to think of there. And, you know, it's just one of those things where it's nice to be able to say, hey, this is what we're going to do. And then we're going to address the source of the issue. But if let's look at a domestic violence situation, if you have a husband and wife and they're fighting over finances, for example, which is which is the cause of a lot of our domestic violences. And you bring in a social services unit. What are they going to do? Are they going to start writing checks? Are they going to start offering loans? I mean, how are you really going to address that that situation, address the root cause of that situation while you're there on scene? It's just it's not going to happen. You know, there's there's probably going to need there's probably going to be a need for some outside assistance, you know, maybe through financial assistance, you know, marriage counseling, whatever the case is. But that's not going to that should not be something that's placed on the shoulders of law enforcement. That is not in the purview of the police department. No. Now, let's be clear that El Paso County was founded in 1850 in San Elizario. That's the origins of El Paso County. It moved to downtown in 1883. But since the very beginning, police and the judiciary have been the core functions of government. And for most of that time, well over a century, the county has focused on those core functions. 
And we're talking about uh, a candidate who wants to expand that function and go into other areas that are going to be very costly and very expensive at a time when the county is implementing budget cuts across the board. Uh, they're financially strained. And it seems to us at the El Paso Taxpayer Revolt that Mr. Ugarte, with all due respect for his distinguished service, is, is quite naive uh, when it comes to this kind of thing. It's really easy and pretty sounding to say, I'm going to create this, I'm going to create that, but of course, how do you pay for it? That's what distinguishes leadership. Right. You know, a real candidacy. How are you going to pay for it? Right. Tell us about your priorities. So, so the, I, I'm, I'm focused on public safety. Like I said, I have a vested interest in the safety of this community. Um, you, you see that there's areas of El Paso County that, that have grown. Um, the East Lake Rojas area, for example, we've got so many new homes and businesses and the Amazon Center out there. And we have not expanded our law enforcement capacity to be able to provide adequate police coverage out there. Uh, they, we, we need investigators uh, to, to follow up with criminal investigations out there. Uh, the officers that are working this area come from the Montana station or come from the Clint station. So you've got these, these individuals who are living out here, these citizens, and I'm one of them. I live out in the unincorporated area. So I do have an interest in the quality of police work that takes, that, that, that takes place in, in the unincorporated areas. Uh, we don't have sufficient coverage there. You've only got two officers. It's the same number of officers that have been there since 2012. Two officers? Two for, officers. For how large an area? Yes. Well, you're looking at, this, is, this serves as two districts. It's two overlapping districts. And you're going from I-10 uh, north of Clint to the Pelicano area. And now you've got roadways that are actually leading all the way up into Montana. So I would, I would assume that those, that those roadways and those additional subdivisions are also part of these, part of these districts. I, I, I was not in patrol, so I don't, I don't have the exact, the exact specifications of where the districts are drawn or the district boundaries are drawn. But I can tell you that the two officers that work out in this area, this is our busiest district. Um, and we need, we need to increase our, our, our police presence here. Okay, we need to increase our police presence, and I think you had uh, some innovative ideas for how to fund that, uh, yes. by finding efficiencies in other areas. Right. You We're go back into your agencies. Channels. Yes. So, so, so the the other thing is is going into our the, the the second part of my platform is addressing the mental health issues that are in the jails. We've got individuals there that are suffering from from some severe mental illnesses, and unfortunately. They're not receiving the proper care that they, they could be receiving. I think that as a community, we need to do better because the jails have become the new quasi mental health institutions of the community. And, you know, our officers are, are, are having to deal with, with, with people who are very mentally ill. And that's really not their, that's not their role. They're not trained for that. Yes, we do have EHN on staff. Yes, we do have medical services on staff. But it's still the officer's responsibility to deal with these with these individuals. It's a very very um, vulnerable population, uh, but they can also be violent at times. And and you know we got officers getting hurt. And then and, and I just think that we can do better. And if we can get members of the mental health community to come to the table and help us deal with these individuals and maybe find alternatives for incarceration, especially for nonviolent minor offenses. We can, we can actually use less officers to work in the jails, and that might help fund our additional, our additional patrol officers that we, need, that we need out in the street. Because incarceration is costly. It's very costly. So, so we charge $100 a day to the federal government just to incarcerate one inmate. Okay? Um, that cost is, is relative, of course, to any additional mental health, uh, physical health, dental, any additional... Uh, care that they may need. So we're talking minimum of $100 a day per person. So if we can remove, I know that the jail annex has a 96 man cell block um, that, that's set aside just for individuals with mental health. So well, if we can cut that down. Have the cost of, of the entire jail system with all the people who work there, their pensions, their benefits, their vehicles, utilities, and add all that up and divide that by the number of inmates. And then you, you can't tabulate it that way. It's, it's a lot more than yes. $100 a day. Yes. You're in the thousands. Yes, easily. You're yeah. easily in the thousands. So you well, just look at the medical, you know, what, what it would take, you know, when somebody has dialysis. I mean, how much does a regular person or, you know, a person out in the street pay for dialysis? We have 
several engines that require dialysis right. on a regular basis. So there's real potential for savings there by, yes. by not incarcerating individuals or finding alternatives for individuals who are not a danger to other people who could, could be rehabilitated uh, through other means. Yes, and I've spoken to several uh, mental health practitioners and, and they're saying that the key to keeping these individuals uh, from reoffending is keeping a med compliant. And the use of injections rather than pills is, is a lot more effective in keeping somebody med compliant because now you only need an injection every couple of months or up to every, you know, we'll call it three to six months versus um, pills that, that require them to be taking them every single day. And then the side effects from some of these pills, they, they, these individuals don't, they don't want to stay on, on these pills because of the side effects that come with them. Right. And then the other thing that we have to look at is that many times as individuals leave the jails, they don't continue their, their, the, the continue of care um, because they start falling back into the, the drugs and the alcohol that got them there the first time. So, so there's, there, there are a lot, of, a lot of variables in play, but I can tell you that while everybody wants to talk about mental health, and, and I, I truly believe that we need to do something, we need to do better in our community with it, the reality of it is that it's going to take a lot more than just law enforcement to deal with this. Let's talk for a moment um, as we approach the end of our interview about your philosophy of law enforcement. So you know, I, I had the opportunity to interview uh, the DA, uh, Bill Hicks, recently, and we talked about prosecutorial discretion, that as district attorney, he has some discretion about how to enforce the laws, which laws to enforce more, which laws to enforce less. Uh, but there's a certain amount of discretion among peace officers too, right? I mean, you can decide whether or not to pull over that individu individual, whether or not to arrest that prostitute, and you've got discretion. Um, tell us a little bit about how, as sheriff, you would use that discretion, uh, how you would approach uh, hot, hot issues like SB4, for example. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So, so the Code of Criminal Procedure allows for certain uh, discretionary functions in law enforcement. Most of those are going to be limited to Class C misdemeanors. A lot of people say, uh, oh, I can't believe that, you know, officers are out there giving tickets because they have quotas. No, that's absolutely not true. Quotas are completely illegal. As a law enforcement agency, I cannot, or law enforcement head, I cannot mandate that officers issue X amount of citations or, or not issue citations. That is a discretionary function. So along the lines of, of, of our discretion, Class C's play a big, a big part of it. Um, additional uh, offenses that are above a Class C, we don't have nearly the, the discretion involved in. That's actually a good thing. Now, we, we may not necessarily make a physical arrest. We can make, rather than effect a custodial arrest, we can actually paper refer somebody to the court system and the district attorney can decide whether or not they're gonna accept the charges uh, in lieu of, of, of conducting a custodial arrest for an individual if we don't feel that a custodial arrest is necessary at that time. Um, you know, so, so we do have, we do have some, some variables there. But I can tell you that, that the big hot topic right now is, is SB4. And the Code of Criminal Procedure is also very, very specific in the laws and responsibilities of peace officers. And that's in Article 2. And every peace officer raises, raises their hand in an oath and says, I promise to enforce the laws of this state and of the United States to include our federal constitution. In fact, the federal constitution is probably the biggest of, of all your laws that you need to make sure that you, that you always enforce. Uh, because everybody deserves their constitutional rights to be, be protected. Um, so, so when we're talking about SB4, uh, in 2017 there was another SB4 that, that, that first came out and, and the current sheriff sent me to Austin as his delegate uh, to go testify there against that SB4, which is very similar to this SB4 in that it, it, it's very divisive to a Latin binational community. Um, you know, the last thing that we want to do is we don't want people uh, believing that, that they can't come to the sheriff's office for protection because they feel that they're going to be arrested. So I don't support the, the, the idea behind SB4 coming out and saying, hey, we're just going to start arresting people for crossing, crossing the, the river or crossing the border illegally. Um, number one, we don't have the jail space for it. Uh, we already talked about um, $100 per, per inmate per day just to house them. Um, imagine now we, we, we pick up a bunch of people who, who have traveled from other countries 
I mean, it, it's just it's just going to be very very. Everything turned over to Border Patrol is in a different procedure. Well, there's there's two different the, the way the law is written is that number one you can either make the arrest or you can turn them over to Border Patrol or take them to a, to a port of entry. Um, and, and again, it would it would it, it's just it's just the way the law is written. I don't think they really thought out the process by which uh, we were going to deal with people once they were taken into custody. It's just you you once you pull resources from the community. From, from conducting neighborhood checks, you know, answering 911 calls, and taking care of, of the public safety issues. And you take them and you move them over to an immigration enforcement. Um, you're, you're, in my opinion, you're, you're, you're shortchanging the community. Because if, if, I want, if I want my home safe, I want my officers working the street and working my schools, I don't want that officer sitting out there on border highway trying to make arrests. And then what are you going to do with, with these family units that are coming across? You know, that's one thing that wasn't addressed in the bill either. I mean, you've got kids involved. Are we going to, are we going to inundate our foster care system as well with these kids because we're arresting their parents? There's just so many variables there that, that I, I don't think SB4 is the answer to, to our, what we need in our community. And again, I'm focused on public safety. So I have told um, everyone in previous interviews that that's not a priority for me. Now, might there be something that pops up down the road that, that we may need to utilize uh, in, in, in furtherance of a criminal investigation that we may need to utilize some of the statutes? Absolutely. But is that going to be something that we're going to allocate resources to? No, we can't. Of course, if the offender is undocumented and violent or pulled over for driving 110 miles per hour, at that point, immigration status does count. Right, right. And, and, and you know, we... But the, our primary responsibility is going to be the actual state law enforcement to begin with, because we've already got the laws that are being broken. Um, but we do we do um, work with our with our federal counterparts, um, and then they decide. They come into the jails. They look at, at at offenses that are committed by individuals who are undocumented, and then they can decide whether or not they're going to deport somebody after their cases are are, are uh, disposed. By, by the state courts, and you know that's that's something that I do want to continue doing because I think that that everyone working collaboratively is what's going to keep our community safe. You know, if you go back a few years and we we all we all rose that flag, you know, Paso one of the safest cities. One of the things, one of the reasons that we were the safest cities and we are such a safe community is because of the collaboration between the federal officers, the state officers, the county officers, the city officers. Everybody works together, and we need to we need to get that status back. You know, we, we, we've kind of lost that. We, we, we've, fallen, we've fallen down the ladder a little bit there. Uh, but we need, we need to keep our community safe. And we need, uh, my goal is to get us back to where we were. Where we were when? When we were, when we were the safest community. And we were the second safest. That was, that was going back a few years. Just a few years. Ago. Yes. And, and, and I, you know, I think, I think that that's a good feather in the hat of law enforcement. You know, to say, hey, we run, we run, we run a, a very safe community. And... I think it attracts more businesses, it attracts more people to come live here, and I'd like to see that come back. Mm -hmm. The DA tells us that, uh, that crime is increasing in certain categories, burglary and larceny in particular, but not so much in, uh, in, in, in felonies uh, like murder, rape. I don't know, uh, what's your perception? Is, is well, the city becoming less safe? I, 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 think, I, think, I think our crime is definitely rising in, in, in a few categories. Now keep in mind, we have a different crime tracking mechanism in place now than what we had before. We used to use the old Uniform Crime Report through the FBI, and now we use an IDR system, NIBRS, National Incident, Incident uh, Reporting System. So it captures more crimes. So it captures more crimes. So, so of course, more. yes. Okay. So we're probably gonna have to leave NIBRS in place for a few years before we can really compare apples to apples, uh, because NIBRS tracks incidents that UCI never tracked before. But one of the things that I can tell you is that we definitely have a rise in, in in violent crime. I mean, we we we've seen we've seen more with more more crimes being committed with weapons, um, and and I think that that we should do a little bit more to help prevent those weapons from falling into the hands of criminals. And the third part of my platform is that I want to get with the court system, and when an individual has gone through the due process of law, and he's convicted of a of a felony. I would like to, as part of the plea agreement, because nine times out of ten it's a plea agreement, uh, as part of that plea agreement, I would like to take those weapons from his possession or her possession at that time because they're now prohibited by law 
from possessing those firearms. And if we can do that on the front end, we can prevent those weapons from being sold, perhaps to somebody who shouldn't have a weapon, not a or given away, exactly. So I think that we can do better as a community and we can take those weapons off the street on the front end without infringing on anybody's, anybody's civil rights, especially the Second Amendment, uh, because these individuals have already experienced their due process. Now, we have storage, so I would like to, I would like to store those weapons. And if there's going to be a, a, um, an appeal, that's fine. I would rather pay for more storage space. That's a lot cheaper than paying for funerals. Right. Uh, yeah, of course. Wow. It's just a uh, very impressive resume. A lot of experience, a lot of Thank you. Law enforcement, administration, managing large bu budgets. Uh, you seem like an all-around solid candidate. How much money have you raised so far? Oof, well, we had raised... Prior to the runoff, we were at about 118000 mm -hmm. um, But that money, remember, when, 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 I, when I announced, nobody knew who I was. So we, we, had, to, we had to put together some ads that were very expensive. We had to um, concentrate on getting my name out there. And, and um, so a lot of money went into social media and, and, and uh, just media in general to get my name out there. So that, that was a very, very expensive process. And how, then, about, how about block walking? You, you busy oh, we're, 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 doing, we're, we're, we're getting ready to pick up our block walking again. We're having new, new uh, uh, door hangers uh, reprinted and designed or redesigned and printed. There are 800,000 people living in this county, 830,000 people. How do, you, how do you even approach that as a block walker? Well, you know, we, we do our best. That's that's where your that's where your 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 analysts come in and they say, hey, we're going to hit this area because we've got a high concentration on voters here. We've got right. We're going to hit this area, and and we, but I will tell you this: the team that I have has has just been awesome. You got a good um, strategist. Great, a good good strategist, and and the team, the people that come together on Saturdays. You know that that I have anywhere between fifteen to twenty people every single time we get together and go out and block walk. And these are 15 to 20 people that are volunteering their time because they believe in me and they believe in our, in, in, in our vision. Uh, these aren't people that we're paying. Uh, I haven't paid a single block walk. I know you're very popular in the force. I mean, every time I post a Bobby Flores anything on our social media platforms, not one or two, but scores of, of current and former police officers weigh in. Go, Bobby. He's the yeah. guy. And it's just, you seem very popular among the police. You know, the, those those are all relationships that I've built over the years, and like I said, I'm truly blessed. I've, I've always I've always maintained a level of humility, and, and, and you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. Um, so, so I'm honored to see those. I, I know I know I get I get a few a few zings every now and then, but I can tell you that that when your peers, who are usually the most uh, honest with you, have good things to say about you, that carries a lot of weight because they don't owe you anything. That's right. And, and, they don't owe you anything. And so so when 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 some of my former officers contact me on the site and say, hey, I want to sign and I want to help you and let me know when you're going out block walking and, and they're coming out here and, 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 and helping us, helping the cause, it's very, very humbling to me, very humbling. And, 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 and I'm really, really grateful for everyone who's helped me in, in, this, in this campaign. Okay. Well, look, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your service. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Of this of uh, very distinguished service. And uh, to wish you the best of luck in your campaign. Again, we at the El Paso Taxpayer Revolt uh, support very strongly Bobby's campaign for county sheriff. Can you tell our viewers one more time uh, how they can learn more about you online and how they can donate and how they can join, this, join your block walking team? So, again, my, my website is bobbyfloatersforsheriff.com. Um, if you go to that, that site, you will see uh, my bio, you'll see some of my platform uh, uh, perspectives. And then there's also a link there to donate, and, and your donations uh, are, are absolutely needed. I mean, I've got a tough opponent, I've got, I've got an uphill battle um, in order to win this election, but, but we're in it to win it, and we're going to fight to the end. Um, and so if you can contact us, there's even a link there to, to send out, a, you can send me a specific message. And there's a phone number there that, that I do have, uh, and you can contact that phone if you leave me a voicemail. I prefer a text. Because it's a lot easier for me to get back to you uh, once once you text me, um, and I, I definitely do my part to to uh, respond to every one of those uh, as I get them. But it does take me some time because sometimes I do get more than on some days than others. But I really, really humbly ask for for your support uh, to be your next sheriff. I won't let you down. I've, I've got the qualifications, I've got the experience, uh, I've got the the desire to do it, and and and, and I've also got the work ethic and. 
I think that 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 says a lot for our county. We need a sheriff we can be proud of, and and I think I'm that guy. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Thank you again. I appreciate.